Welcome back, Royal Family. January 14th, Year of Our Lord, 2021. Middle of the month, January 14th, Year of Our Lord, 2021. Let me try this chair again. I just bought it, and it's incredible. Yeah, it keeps dropping down. You're like, ah, make me crazy. I'm not touching the handle, and it keeps dropping down. Uh, I don't want to be any shorter than I am looking here. I'm 5'8", I'm so I'm not like I'm tall to begin with. But, uh, you know, the chair is like, boom, keeps dropping on me. It's brand new. I'm not a happy camper. Okay, so having said that, a couple announcements. What do we have? Today is Lesson 268 of the Matthew series. Matthew, Lesson 268, the plan of God for all and the personal plan just for you. I hope that makes sense. Uh, we're finishing up the Divine Decree study we did. This will be our third hour on the Divine Decree. So I hope by the end of this, you understand what that theological term means, Divine Decree. It means it was done millions and billions of years ago. Everything is encompassed into the Divine Decree, one and done. That's why I don't say decrees, because we believe the men that ordained me and my lineage and myself as well, obviously I'm not a clone. I have to come to my own beliefs and my own study. It shows me our all-powerful God, our majestic, sovereign God can say one thing, one word, and it's done. So we have to say decree, singular. That's our study, the plan of God today. The plan of God for all, a generalized plan of God, and then your personal plan just for you. So tune in if you've wanted to know certain things about the plan of God, and then your personal plan. Does it exist? Yes, it is in Scripture. It is in Scripture. But again, we're going to look at our own personal responsibility that we have to grow up in order to get in that. So, January 14th, Year of Our Lord, 2021. So much going on. Um, I said I'm going to do some kind of um, short video, 15 to 20 minutes maybe in that neighborhood. Probably tomorrow or Saturday, I'll put it out there. It is not a Bible study. Repeat, even though I'm going to put some scriptures on the board to back up what I believe. It is not a Bible study. It will not go on the other platforms that are Bible study platforms. I do not interfere with Bible study platforms. They need to be focused on the Word of God and Bible study, not personal opinions or not historic context showing what's going on politically and lining it up in the world. So um, those are things a pastor does occasionally because he wants to wake up his followers. And if he has a heart of a patriot, he will say, hey, something's wrong over here. We're not going in the direction we need to go in. Be careful of this evil, and it'll give you a warning. I'll explain some of that when I do that um, 2021 video, I guess I'm going to call it. So any questions on that? It is coming. I do have some notes on it. I just need to make sure it's said in the right way and done in the right way. Um, and I need to make sure the Spirit is pushing me. I want to pray about it one last time before I upload it. So uh, probably tomorrow or Saturday you'll see it pop up. It will only probably be on my YouTube page, maybe the MeWe page, or, or even my personal Facebook, Richard Betes. It will not be on PRB Ministry um, Bible Study page or a Facebook page. It's just not going to be. It's not part of it. I respect the boundaries between the two. Okay, so having said that, uh, we want to keep that in prayer. We want to keep our president in prayer. We know he, it's possible he is coming out of the White House in a couple of days. It's possible a lot of things could happen in a couple of days, and I'll be addressing that, obviously, in that video. So please be safe. Please realize there are nefarious forces behind the scenes that would like us to look like violent idiots, and they're going to try to goad you into doing certain things at rallies and there are there is evidence that um, about half a dozen or more of the characters that broke in to the Capitol building were some of the same characters and people and funding that were happening during the summer summer of love peaceful riots Antifa Black Lives Matter so the mainstream media is not telling you that but that is a fact so having said that please be careful keep you all in prayer in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, and like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. In respect to your salvation, you have to take in the Word of God growing after salvation. You have to take in the Word of God. You have to have your fellowship in order being filled with the Spirit to be able to really absorb the Word and have it really make sense and be able to apply in your life. Having said that, we need to wash any sin from our life. 1 John 1.8 tells the believers, if we say we have no sin, 
We are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness, sins you might not have recognized. In verse 10 it says, Believers, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Let us take a moment of silent prayer, pray for each other. First thing we do is wash the sin from our life, then we can have our prayers heard accurately. Fellowship is accurate. Let us pray for one another, pray for peace, pray for healing across this world. And I also want to give a shout out. Somebody from Kansas City um, sent an envelope with no return address. Kansas City. Um, with no uh, return address with some cash to my P.O. box. So <laughs> thank you. Um, and, you know, send a return address. I'll send you a thank you or a receipt if you'd like. Even though I'm not tax exempt, I send receipts to certain people when I believe they want to keep track of their donation. So thank you, Kansas City. Every head is bought, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're asking for you to just lift those people up that have followed this ministry, support this ministry, understand your word, and really want to get to know you. Lift them up, protect them, lift them up in their spirits, Father. Give them guidance to know that you are in control. They need to relax and realize you are in control. There are certain steps we can take, Father, as soldiers, ambassadors for Christ, as believer priests, and as patriots in whatever country we're living in, certain steps we can take to ensure that we can go, go forward as leaders in our circle of family and friends and examples. And we're going to go over those steps, Father, as time goes on, Father. Let them recognize that they can be a beacon of light in the right arena, in the right way, if they do not let their emotions get the best of them. But lift them up and protect them, Father. Let the healing hand, of uh, Father, come across this globe with this vaccines and with this virus, we know some of it is real. We know some of it is blown out of proportion. Father, we're just looking for the truth. Let your healing hand come across this globe. And again, I ask for protection for all the folks that have contacted me this past year in 2020 and have lifted up this ministry in different realms, Father. Please protect them and guide them. Welcome the newcomers on this channel, Father, and let them know this is simply a grace-based ministry. We do not charge for anything. We do not demand anything. We simply go forward. And when people feel moved to lift this ministry up or promote it or give donations to it, Father, we just ask that you protect them and move them forward in your plan. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Just so you know, that's what this grace-based ministry is all about. You don't force anybody to do anything, but you realize no man, no church, no ministry can go forward without support in different realms. So we're actually going to look at that a little bit today, too. Let's jump into it. Um, we're going to open today. Open up today with the Apostle Paul teaching what? The believers at Ephesus go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 with me today. Understanding the divine decree, which we just spent two hours clarifying, should now open up questions as to God's plan for all of us and even our own personal life what we are to do in the plan of God that should open up when you start looking at the divine decrees you're talking about the plan of God and what is in the plan of God so those questions should start opening up about what's going on in the world what is the plan unfolding in front of me is there a personal plan just for you those are good questions to ask after looking at the divine decree I'm going to answer a few today for you the plan of God was designed in eternity past as your personal plan also all of which were factored in to the divine decree. So the plan of God was designed in eternity past, as was your personal plan, secondary, your personal plan also, all were factored into that divine decree, I told you, in one moment of time. You go into Ephesians 1.1. Pick it up in Ephesians 1.1. So I think I've clarified that. Now you can look at the plan of God in general and then your personal plan. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that he starts off with grace because the, really the plan of God, you'll see again how important grace is. Foundation of everything, folks. Foundation of everything. Ephesians 1.3, let's pick it up there. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has who has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Everything the believer needs 
is set for them and either added into the escrow account or woven into their spiritual walk at a certain point. Either way, it was done in eternity past, having been done already, having blessed us already, divine decree. That's what we need to think about. Every believer needs to set everything their need is, not necessarily desires and what you lust for, your needs, what you need to be able to grow and move forward, is already set for them, either added into their escrow blessing account from the divine decree, eternity past, or it's woven into their spiritual walk at some point in the future at this moment of time. Either way, all wrapped up in the divine decree, already done, millions, perhaps billions of years ago, we don't know. This was all done, part of divine decree, folks, possibly millions or billions of years ago. We can debate that on another day. Notice it is through what? The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, Without our divine union with Christ, it never comes to fruition. In Christ, in Christ, that union is so very important. It never comes to fruition without first being born again and unsaved. And second, reflecting Jesus Christ and taking advantage of that union. What you have secured for you in the heavenly is available in certain portions right now in time. What you have already secured for you in heaven. There are certain portions of what's already secured for you in the heavenly that you can have right now in time and reflect and touch on right now in time. Please understand that statement. I'll say it again. Again, repetition. This was all done part of the divine decree millions of years ago, possibly billions of years ago. Notice it is through what? The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, without our divine union with Christ, it never comes to fruition. If you're not born again and saved and get that union, or learn to walk in that union accurately, it will not come to fruition. What you have secured for you in the heavenly is available in certain portions right now in time. Ephesians 1.4 goes on to say, Paul says what? Verse 4. Just as he had chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. I covered many of these principles last lesson. Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, notice how it connects to Jesus Christ constantly, all the time, according to the kind intention of his will. Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, there it is, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Freely bestowed on us, because real grace cannot be earned or deserved. Grace is the foundation, folks. Foundational principle in God's plan, meaning God is the only one capable of giving it and in operating in it, because he's the only one holy enough to do it. There is nobody more pure, more righteous than God. We have, That's why Jesus Christ came and walked and talked as a man, the doctrine of the hypostatic union, so we have our connection through Christ to God. So understand that grace, like I told you before, things like grace and mercy that we see God able to give us and operate in, there are counterfeits in the cosmic system, but it's incapable in the flesh and humanity to do it. Or the angelic beings, incapable without God. So real grace, real mercy, real forgiveness, all these things, incapable without God. Just so you understand that. We cannot work our way into God's favor and grace from our flesh. Once you put flesh in it, it stops the process. In his divine grace plan, he laid out everything in eternity past and gave when we did not even earn or deserve his attention. We cannot work our way into it. The flesh gets in the way. He laid out everything in eternity past and gave, already gave, past tense. All of this is past tense. Gave when we did not earn or deserve it. And certainly his attention. Before we were a twinkle in the eye of God, it was done. What the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did on the cross at Calvary is the greatest act of love, compassion, and grace ever displayed in the universe. Bar none. What Jesus Christ did on that cross, greatest act of love, compassion, and grace ever displayed in the universe. We can never live up to that, and it is arrogant and blasphemy, really, to try and think you can do something to change the cross or live up to the cross. Be very careful with that. Religion has a history of doing that. Arrogance and legalism has a history of doing that. 
the pain, humiliation, and suffering of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is something we deserved, all of us, not him. Not him. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says what? In 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He, he became that sin offering that we should have stood there and took the hit. He did. In other words, the lightning bolt from the justice system of God came down upon Christ when it should have hit all of us, every man, woman, and child born since Genesis and into the future. He stood in the way. The concept and foundation of the plan of God is grace. The concept and the foundation, all of it, plan of God is grace. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace, grace, you have been saved through faith, that none of yourselves, it is the gift of God, it is not of yourselves. Again, be careful putting your hand in the plan of God. It is a gift of God. It's a grace gift. In verse 9, not as a result of work so that no one may boast. This is why when you think about it, I want you to think about something here. This is why when somebody says they can lose their uh, uh, salvation, when you have somebody preach loss of salvation, and we don't have Christ preaching loss of salvation, and people say you can lose your salvation, that means they're, what you're doing can affect the cross. What you're doing is so strong, it is so negative, so strong, that it was not, it, it cannot be dealt with on the cross. You removed the act and the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Are you that powerful? Do you think when they use the term eternal life, the apostles or Jesus Christ use the term eternal life. Eternal means it, it's forever, it cannot be interrupted. So therefore, why would they use that term? There are so many scriptures that tell us we cannot be snatched out of the hand of God, that nothing we can do, angelic or any wise, otherwise, can we get out of salvation. Once saved, always saved. You cannot touch the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? It is a grace gift offered to all mankind. Notice the only responsibility we have is a positive moment in time. Faith. A little breath of faith in time. That's it. The common sense approach to the basic plan of God we're going to look at for mankind is faith alone and Christ alone. You need to understand that concept when we talk about the basic initial plan of God for everyone and everything. The basic initial plan of God starts with what? Faith alone and Christ alone. That is it. John 3.16, For God so loved the chosen few, for God so loved only the good people that were really good enough that could live up. No. For God so loved the world, cosmos, the whole world that Satan is in control of and God allowed it. He loves. And he gave his only begotten son that some who believe, that a few who believe, that only the righteous who believe, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world, all of it, everyone, beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, might be saved through him. First step in the plan of God. You can see it again in Acts 15, 11, Acts 16, 31, Romans 10, 9, John 6, 29, John 6, 47, and oh, by the way, probably about seven to ten other scriptures I could have threw up there not even getting into the Old Testament as well. Acts 15.11 tells us the same story. Acts 16.31, Romans 10.9, John 6.29, John 6.47 tell us the same story. Take a note for your own sake, your own study, your own homework, as I often tell you. The world might be saved. I love that statement, the last sentence there in verse 17. Might. Because you have to make a choice, meaning it is an open invitation to have faith in Jesus Christ. Might be saved if you believe. Anyone. Good person, bad person. Whatever the standard is in the world, because who really sets up the standard of what's good and bad? That always makes me laugh. God's standards are higher than man's standards. Therefore, when you have a man or a woman saying, 
well, this is not too bad. This sin is not really sin. It's good enough. Like my little white lie is not a big deal, but the prostitute on the street corner, that's real sin. Really? Whose standard is that? That's your standard. That's not God's standard. Steal a pencil at work. It is the same thing as the thief who robbed the bank and shot the teller. Whoa, no, no, no. That's a, I'm telling you it is. As far as the overall salvation picture, sin being sin. Sin is sin. Part one of the plan of God is centered on salvation. Without that, we are lost. First, understand that. The general initial plan of God for everyone. Salvation. Faith alone and Christ alone. Without that, we are lost. Step two. In the basic overall plan of God I'm speaking about is about what you do after salvation. Now, we're going to encompass all believers, those who even reject Christ after salvation. 2 Peter 3.17 You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, pay attention, Peter's teaching, believers after salvation, so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men, those that don't study accurately the word of God and teach inaccuracy, and fall from your steadfastness, your strength and your faith, verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's it. Step two, salvation, faith alone in Christ alone, basic plan of God for humanity, all the world. Step two, after salvation, now what? Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Be on your guard. That's a good warning for Peter. Be on your guard. I'm, I'm giving you, I give the same warning as Peter and Paul and John does. Any good pastor will. Be on your guard against what? Cosmic system. The world we live in, the distractions, the false teachers, the nonsense that leads you away from the truth. Be on your guard. Then grow in the grace God has offered you. Notice what becomes before knowledge. Grace. Grow in the grace. But what I tell you about just a few lessons ago. If your faith is going to be strong and your walk's going to be, you better understand what grace is all about and how you can't put your hand in it. Then grow in the grace God has offered you, step one, and then grow in the knowledge because the grace will give you room to grow in the knowledge because you know you're going to fumble and fail and you understand grace is there for you and mercy is attached to that as well. Meaning the mind of Christ. Knowledge means what? Bible. The mind of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.15. But speaking the truth, important statement, truth meaning Bible doctrine, in love in unpersonal, unconditional love, agapao, agape love, we are to grow up. We are to what? Sit on the couch and not apply Bible doctrine, not learn the word, become a couch potato Christian? No. Speak truth first. Make sure it's Bible doctrine, accurate, in love, applying that in personal, unconditional love, and then learn to grow up in all aspects into Christ, who is the head, even Christ. You're growing in the plan of God and the mind of Christ is what helps you grow. Colossians 1.10, what does Paul say there? So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord after salvation, after step one in the plan of God, to please him in all respects, because what will happen after a period of time is you will bear fruit, not right away. It might take nine months, it might take nine years, I don't know what your growth rate is and how serious you are. Bearing fruit, that's a call right there. Bearing fruit means you're growing in every good work, increasing in what? The knowledge of God. The whole trinity, really, you should understand, but you don't understand that unless you understand the mind of Jesus Christ, the Bible. That's the calling, folks. Increasing in knowledge. Keep on, present tense, keep on increasing so that the knowledge turns to what one day when you start to apply it? Wisdom. Keep on increasing in knowledge so that it turns into wisdom. You have to get to that point where it turns into wisdom. It does not turn into wisdom. I explained to you about the car mechanic principle. You can sit in a class for nine months and learn how to tear apart an engine, and you can read the manuals and get the instructions, but until you can tear that engine apart a few times, you don't have real wisdom. You have some knowledge, 
you're a little bit familiar, you understand, but you haven't applied any of it and learned it and, and got some confidence and moved forward in it, and it hasn't become part of your norms and standards in your daily life. Wisdom. 1 Peter 2.2. 2. This should be familiar. Is it not? Like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. Growth. I use that all the time. Every believer, after the cross, excuse me, after they, they cross the salvation gates after the cross as well, obviously, but after they cross the salvation gates should be what? On a journey. That's what a lot of people don't understand. It is a journey to know Christ in his mind, the Bible. Accurately, of course, this is step two of the plan of God for all people. That's the calling in the plan for all people. Grow up after the salvation gate. What do you do now? Salvation. Now what? Something else. Part of the plan of God. Step two. And it is a journey. First, <clears throat> excuse me. First is that God wants all people to cross that salvation gate. Get past that because that secures everything, folks. Even if you fail after the salvation gate and quit, at least you're in heaven, right? You might be a loser believer, but at least you're in heaven. So you got to get across that salvation gate. Enter into eternal security. Second is grow up spiritually. So when somebody asks you, well, you know about God's plans for yeah, I do. When you're done with this today, you're gonna to be able to say, Yeah, I do. I knew I know God's plan. When they throw it at you and be arrogant, you can be um you can be strong, not arrogant, and proud in your spirit, what you know doctrinally, not your flesh, and say, I do know the plan of God. And in fact, there is a personal plan secondary underneath the general plan of God, and I can explain that too. And you'll be able to do it. First is what? Cross that salvation goal. That's the first part of the plan. Enter into eternal security. Faith alone in Christ alone. Second, grow up spiritually. And that is a lifelong journey. I'm on it. You're on it. If you listen to my voice, we're all on it. Journey. And it does have ups and downs. It does have lulls and times of boredom. It is very seasonal. The plan of God for our lives, how we walk forward, is very seasonal. I use the New England because I grew up in New England, even though I've lived in about three different states or four different states and traveled. I'm back in New England now, obviously. The weather, the seasons. Love relationships have seasons. They just do. Sometimes they're blazing hot. Other times they cool off. Sometimes it's just nice weather and it's calm and relaxed. Other times there's horrible storms and it gets cold. Seasons, journey, folks, has its ups and downs, hills, valleys, and mountains along the way. It's not about religion. It's a relationship. You ever heard that? What a tr no, no truer statement than that. We, act we actually use that in an outreach program I was involved in about two years ago, two or three years ago, back in uh, Grace Bible Church, Somerset, Mass. We were doing evangelist outreach programs in the local uh, communities. And we would use that as one of our logos. It's not, a, it's not about religion. It's a relationship. And a relationship is a journey. That's what I'm telling you. Third, third is that you are willing to share the good news of Jesus Christ and his perfect work. So the third part of God's plan in the generalized plan of God for everybody, after salvation, after you start to grow a little bit, the third part of the plan is, will you share the news, the good news, of Jesus Christ and his perfect work. Are you willing to do that? Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make what? Disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And don't get me off on a tangent on water baptism because there's lots of baptisms in the Bible and you have to be in the dispensation you're living in applying the right one. One baptism of the Spirit. That's what it talks about. But what do you do? Make disciples. How do you make disciples? You first better tell them the good news of Christ and get them a little bit of a truth and maybe they'll fall in love with the Lord and become disciples. Mathate, students, mathematicians, they understand things. The believer can do this. Any believer can do this. One of three ways. One of three ways by supporting outreach ministries that go across the world and preach the gospel. Listen, there was an African ministry that um, I know... Uh, Grace Bible Church started and uh, Sammy started over there. So I, my wife and I were immediately, we we, vet, we made sure we vetted what was going on and we understood, okay, it looks like a good uh, pastor there in Africa because there's a lot of frauds and shams. We vetted as soon as we did, we sent money over there. 
because I want the word of God to get out in Africa. So that's one way. Maybe you give some financial support. Maybe it's just $20 a month to a ministry that is giving Bibles and the word of God out into different countries. That's an easy way to evangelize. Or, secondary, they can get involved. The believer can get involved. Start a ministry. Go on a mission yourself. Plan next year to go on a mission for 10 days somewhere that you, with a ministry you trust and teaching accurately. And the third is simply by being a positive Christian. The easiest one, probably. Be a positive Christian in your circle of family and friends and speak about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You don't have to do it every minute or every day and hit people over the head with the Bible. That turns people off. You pick your spots with your verbal communication skills and talk about Jesus Christ. But your lifestyle reflects certain things the circle of family and friends start to see. You evangelize that way, as well as living that life, speaking and living that life that reflects Jesus Christ. You evangelize because you're an ambassador for Christ. Listen, listen to me. Just bring a friend to church, a good church, or sharing a link. A lot of people don't realize that. Sharing a link like this message is a form of evangelism. It's not difficult, folks. You're growing in the plan of God. You're a growing believer. How much is it for you to click a link and copy and paste it and send it in an email or send it to somebody or put it on a social media platform and say, hey, listen to Pastor Rick or listen to this word of God or look at this track or come to this church that's teaching the gospel accurately. How hard is that? Easy to evangelize. Mark 16, 15, and Jesus said to them, what, go, go into the whole world, all the world, preach the gospel to all creations. Speak it to the rocks and trees if you have to, if you really love the Lord. Acts 1, 8, what does that say? But you will re receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, the beginning of the church age, folks, indwelling power. And you shall be my witnesses, all of us, every believer, even if you're, you've never evangelized, you were called to do that part of the plan of God. You're just not following the plan. Be my witnesses, both what? Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, in other words, all these different areas, and even to what? The remotest part of the earth. The remotest part of the earth. Listen, if this ministry ever blew up and I had a, a brick and mortar church, as soon as we got enough uh, people interested and it was big enough that it was paying its bills and everybody was able to function as a normal church, then you could take some money and send it overseas to somebody you trust. Be very careful where you send your donations and money. I'm going to cover some of those principles. Be very careful where your time, talent, treasure go. I'll cover some of that in my 2021 upcoming little chat I'm going to have with you guys. But we have to get the word out there, folks. It's part of evangelizing. All believers, all believers can evangelize if they simply grow up grow up enough and speak accurately, make sure its accuracy is important, and with compassion, as well as live a life of Christian values. How hard is it to live a life of Christian values? If you're married, you are a Christian husband, Christian wife, you have kids, you live Christian values. Doesn't mean you're perfect. That's not the issue, folks. But if you're a good husband, you try to treat the wife in a certain way that Christ treats the church. If you're a good Christian wife, you respect and honor your husband, and you both try to lead a life that will give examples to those kids, and you're involved in a Bible study or a church, you do certain things that are Christian. You show examples of trying to give forgiveness and mercy to others because you've been given it. There's a lot of ways you can display and evangelize it. It's not about perfection, folks. It's simply not. It's about walking in your calling as an ambassador for Christ. Walking in your calling as an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador represents another country. That's the basic principle of an ambassador. When they come to the country they stay in, they're representing their country, their country's values, what their country represents, and they try to do so in a gentle, compassionate way that shows everybody, look at my country and how we are, handle certain things. Look at me, I'm a representative of that country. Ambassadors. God would rather see you bring one person God would rather see you bring one person to him with compassion and accuracy than 20 people who you had to use shame, guilt, and lies to get them interested in God. Because out of those 20, very few will become born again and saved. Everybody understand that principle? Be careful how you 
deal with evangelism, compassion and truth, accuracy. Luke 15, 7 tells us what? I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. In other words, the right thing done in the right way, one means more than a hundred. The fourth portion, number four, fourth portion of the basic plan of God is strength. What do you mean, Pastor Rick? Spiritual growth should give you strength. The calling in God's plan, the initial basic plan for all the world, all believers, is that number four, step four is, you get to a point where you've grown up enough spiritually where you have some strength, some endurance. Part of the plan of God for all believers is to be prepared for the battles ahead because they are there. It isn't a name it and claim it life we live in and everything is fluffy and perfect. Sorry to tell you, that doesn't happen until we know the thousand year millennial reign. 1 Timothy 6.12, what does Paul say? 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Not walk the easy walk of faith. Fight the good fight of faith, Paul is saying. Battle time. Take hold of that eternal life. Realize you have it. Get secure in that to which you were called. And you made the good confession the presence of many witnesses. What you've already proclaimed after salvation should be, I believe in Christ, I want to live this life. In your actions and in your words. Then hold on to that eternal security. That will give you strength. Grow. But there is a battle coming, so you better grow. The call for every believer, every believer, in the plan of God, be prepared. What are soldiers called to do? Train, be in good shape, check your equipment, be prepared for battle, stand in the gap during the heated exchanges and the battles that are certain to come to your doorstep, I'd say now more than ever. Endurance. What does this mean? Endurance and preparation are needed. So yes, part of the plan of God for everybody is at some point or another, you better gain some momentum which gives you endurance and preparation and strength to stand in there. Because Paul says to what? Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 9, 26. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. Run takes effort. He's not talking about whistling his way through the rose garden on a nice day. Run in such a way that takes some effort. As not without aim. In other words, I have goals. I box in such a way as not to beat the air. The only thing I could think of when I looked at that was shadow boxing. People say, well, there is shadow boxing. Yeah, but if you don't do shadow boxing in the right way, you can actually hurt yourself. But what do you mean? Go ahead and throw a punch without pulling it back the right way or getting your stance the right way. Your elbows and shoulders are going to hurt because you're not hitting anything. You're boxing the air. So you better do it in the right way. It's meant for cardio and endurance for your shoulders and arms to be able to hold up a long period of time. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. Silliness. I'm doing it with accuracy. Verse 27, but I discipline. There it is right there. My body. Make it my slave. I can tell you there were people that fell for the false flag at Capitol Hill and followed in a lot of paid violent protesters, the same ones this summer that did a lot of damage. They followed them because you know why? They didn't discipline their body and make it a slave. Their emotions got the best of them. And they followed a trap. I discipline my body and make it my slave. You better get control of your tongue, your body, your emotions. So that after I preach to others, I myself might not be disqualified. Paul's not talking about loss of salvation. Disqualified for what? Escrow blessings, rewards, in time, eternity. That's what he's talking about. Part of that strength is that you recognize your flesh. That's what it talks about. You better recognize your flesh. And your flesh is useless. And when you can submit to God in the power of God the Holy Spirit... You can be used as a soldier in spiritual warfare. I'll say it again. Let me grab a drink. But underline, I discipline my body and make it my slave. And think about the nonsense some people got involved in recently because they had no control over their emotions, which means they had no control over their tongue or their body. Believe me, you're talking about somebody who's half Irish. I got a good temperament as far as losing it every once in a while and letting my righteous indignation go to temper and impatience. One of my weak areas there. Satan knows about it. Now you guys know about it. So, 
Part of that strength is that you recognize your flesh is useless. And when you can submit to God the proper way, in the power of God, the Holy Spirit, you can be used as a soldier in the spiritual warfare, and you need to be. It's part of the plan. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul talks to the church at Corinth again. And he has said to me, what? My grace, God has already spoken to Paul in his prayers, my grace is sufficient for you. If God is telling you and not answering a prayer, he's telling you, stay where you're at and deal with the situation. My grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in what? My flesh working out, being angry, uh, uh, strength in my own... No, my weakness. What do you mean? Power is perfected in weakness because you recognize how weak your flesh is. Most gladly, therefore, Paul said, I would rather boast about my weakness understanding my flesh so that the power of Christ can dwell in me and may dwell and work in me understand your flesh folks get a handle on it you become strong by applying faith and Bible doctrine to your life we've talked about these principles you become strong and endurance ready a ready soldier by applying faith and Bible doctrine to your life which means you had better digested a lot of doctrine to apply in bad times which means understanding God's grace and learning to live in God's grace again to the church at Corinth Paul 1 Corinthians 15 10 and by the grace of God I am what I am you guys know I do imitations right and you guys know I have a Popeye tattoo on my right arm even though I was an army guy <laughs> I have a Popeye's my favorite cartoon character uh, Captain America is my favorite superhero. You guys know all these things. I, t I throw it out there. I don't care how goofy I am. But my Popeye. Whoa, I am what I am and that's all that I am. Whoa. Popeye, I am what I am. And that's all that I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. How's that? Popeye. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, Paul said, but I labored even more than the other apostles and disciples. Yet not I, but the grace of God in me did that. Paul had to. Because he was, what, Saul of Tarsus, and he was rejected by many for a long period of time, disrespected, and yet he was one of the great apostles of his time and wrote Church Age Mystery Doctrine, half the New Testament. The next portion of God's plans for all believers, all, revolves around gaining spiritual maturity so you operate in the right love toward all mankind. That's another basic principle inside God's plan, the initial plan of God for everybody. The next portion of God's plan we're going to look at for all believers revolves around gaining that maturity, spiritual maturity, get to levels of maturity so you can operate in the right love because your emotions aren't in the way. You can operate in that agapao, agape love, unconditional love for all mankind. It's actually a command. It's part of church age mystery doctrine, the grace of doctrines grace john 15 17 this i command you that you love one another it's a command folks but that's not phileo that's not personal love that's not lust that's not emotional love that's impersonal unconditional love remember i've explained that before and i have time today to get into it we can always look at it another day i have lessons on impersonal love just go back and look first john 3 15 everyone who hates his brother is a murderer this speaks to the mind you know how you get mad at somebody and you wish, oh, I'd like to punch them in the face, or I'd like to do this, or I'd like to do I'm so mad because they did this to me. That's a form of hate. Be very careful that that doesn't gain a lot of momentum in your mind because that's the same thing as being a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in them. Believers don't act that way, in other words. Believers don't act, and if they do, they better wash it clean and get rid of it quickly. The last piece of the puzzle, last piece of the puzzle for the general plan of God is to support a ministry that lifts up the Word of God accurately. This one's always tough for a pastor to talk about. You know why? If you're a grace-based pastor and they, they understand that there are so many lies and counterfeits out there and people trying to grab your wallet and filling you with nonsense and trying to fill the seats and take your money, this is hard. I don't like approaching this subject, but I have to. The last piece of the puzzle for the general plan of God, overall plan of God, is to support a ministry that lifts up the Word of God accurately accurately i always use that word we are called to a group or a body that is to become a small part of the whole body of christ how do you become a small part body piece of the whole body you better grow and get under a ministry that's doing so part of your calling 
as ambassadors for Christ is to make sure the accuracy of his word is elevated and brought out to a lost and dying world. How do you do that when you're working 40, 50 hours and you're trying to learn yourself? You need to support men and women, and I don't mean women as pastors, I mean men and women that work in church leadership roles and evangelist roles and different types of ministries that are bringing truth out to a lost and dying world. The parts of the body should come together habitually and act like a body. Romans 12, 4. For just as we have many members in one body, Paul says, and all the members do not have the same function. So are there women in ministry? Yes. They may be prep school teachers. Maybe they're a secretary for a church. Maybe they have a women's group that's putting forth some information that needs to get supported. I don't know. But certainly if you have a pastor, teacher, or a church, you better help to elevate the truth if they're putting it out there. We have many members. All members do not have the same function. Verse 5, so we have who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We're all connected one way or another. If you're a body part, hook up with the body and do something. If you're a finger, make sure you're operating properly. Make sure it's not the wrong finger. <laughs> How's that? Everyone has their calling. Simple way to put it. Everyone has their calling or their personal plan we're going to get into, which we're going to touch on as we close. But there are no excuses, folks. We're still in the basic general plan of God. There are no excuses in the day that we live in that you cannot come together in person or online or get some books or get some literature and grow, but certainly support some kind of ministries or ministries, plural. Some people can afford to support a couple of ministries that are teaching truth. No excuses. Everybody can go online to study the Bible, support a ministry that is accurately handling the word of truth, accurately handling the word of truth. Hebrews 10, 24 says what? Let us consider how to stimulate one another. How do you do that if you're not growing and you don't have truth in your soul? You can't stimulate another believer and help out. To love and good deeds, not forsaking, verse 25, are assembling together. In other words, you're called to do some of these things. However you do it, whether it's from your home computer or at your local community, whatever, coming together, assembling together, as is the habit of some. But encouraging one another... And all the more so as you see the day drawing near. And if you can't see the day drawing near of the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation, folks, time to get some new glasses. Have your eyes checked if you can't see it coming. The reality is we all have our callings for the church leadership. They have to focus on lifting up the word of God accurately, no matter what they are. Listen, if you're a woman and you're running a woman's ministry or an outreach ministry or doing something in your community, make sure the scriptures you're using and the words you're using are elevating people up properly, but they're accurate. Don't take scripture out of context. Therefore, make sure your pastor is feeding you stuff that you can take out to that group becomes important. The reality is we all have callings. And for the church leadership, any church leadership, they have to focus on lifting up the word of God accurately they cannot do that without support on many levels. Support on many levels. A pastor, I've said this before, and this doesn't come from me. It doesn't originate with me. A pastor who has two or three jobs and constant distractions will never be able to study and teach the proper way. I tell people, I've apologized on this channel, and I've apologized to people because I know I've had a couple of different jobs. I'm getting to a place where this is going to be the one. This is it. And I apologize because I feel like I'm giving you some days 70 and 80% of what I can give you. And I'm sorry for that. But I have to pay my bills and I have to survive. But a pastor who has two or three jobs, and this is called the voice of experience here. A pastor who has two or three jobs and constant distractions will never be able to study and teach properly. It's sad. And that is one reason for burnout comes on the scene or lazy teaching habits, which I will never do. I'll exhaust myself before I give you a lazy message. But I can only give so much. I'm not 25 years old anymore, <laughs> even though I'm so hot looking. <laughs> But there's burnout. There's one reason right there. Why does a pastor have to get pulled in 10 different directions or be working at a construction site during the day and then try to teach Bible doctrine? 
or work another job and try to teach Bible doctrine, or have 10 different people sit in his office and need counseling when he needs to be studying and teaching. That's where burnout comes in, and that's where lazy teaching habits come in, because the pastor teacher has to throw himself into the study of the Word. Has to. Has to throw himself into the study of the Word. 1 Corinthians 9.14. It's why you don't get a lot of fluffy messages and fun stories here. Because I throw myself into the word of God till I'm exhausted. And sometimes my wife tells me in the background, I'm going to bed. You've been at it six hours. You're exhausted. I'm exhausted. And we haven't talked for six hours because my nose has been in a book or a Bible or a computer program. Such is life. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that's the reality. 1 Corinthians 9, 14. So also... The Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. This is, I hate teaching this. I hate it. You know why I hate it? And I shouldn't because it's part of the plan of God. Is because it makes me look greedy and that's the last thing I am. Galatians 6, 6. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches them. Listen, Paul was a tent maker for a long time. It took away from his studies until he finally gave up on it and said, that's it. I have to focus on just the word. And I don't care if they trust me as an apostle or a pastor. This is my calling. Finally, finally, we will touch on your own personal plan of God designed just for you. You know the plan of God for all believers now. I'll recap it, but you know it now. I just showed you the plan of God, overall plan of God for the whole world and all believers. Now, what about your personal calling? What about your life? You first need to fulfill the mandates I just listed in the basic plan of God. Because your own personal plan will take greater divine insight and time to figure out. So now, what about your personal plan, your personal calling? Let me say this again. You first need to fulfill the mandates I just went over. Everything I've just gone over and listed in the basic plan of God. Because your own personal plan will take greater growth, greater divine insight and time to figure out. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training, important one. That's why you need to be in the word of God. In righteousness, verse 17, so that what? A man or woman of God can be adequately equipped for every good work. So therefore, grow up and gain that strength and momentum we just talked about. And this is not just adequate, it means complete or perfected is the definition. Arteus, the Greek word arteus. Adequate may be a little bit lame definition. It really means perfect, excuse me, perfected or completed. Speaks to a skill set. That word really speaks to a skill set. You ever met a really good carpenter or a good plumber, a good electrician or a good welder, and you're like, man, they're good. Yeah. Because they've completed the training, they've perfected their art. That's what this speaks to. A skill set, something you've acquired over time. And it can also be used something fitted or suited just for you. I find that interesting. I've been fitted for a couple of suits in my day. Because the way I'm built is I have to buy, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm built short and stocky. Uh, I have this uh, kind of pit bull kind of build like my dad did. You know, I'm 5'8 and I'm like 185 and uh, I mean, I'm like... <laughs> built like a little pit bull. So I have to get suited or fitted for certain shirts and suits for things to fit right. If I want a really nice suit, it means that too. It means fitted just right. There was some effort put in there, but then it was suited and fitted just perfectly. Think about that, suited just for you. Until the believer gains some maturity and gets into a serious relationship with the Lord, their calling and personal plan will remain very cloudy. Sorry to tell you, until the believer gains some maturity, if you wanted easy answers, I don't have it. Until the believer gains some maturity and gets into a serious relationship with the Lord, their calling and their personal plan, beyond the regular plan of God, will remain very cloudy for them. They're going to be very confused. There are callings inside the church that need to be handled seriously, such as what? Church leadership and administration, everything needs to be handled seriously, but certainly church leadership, administration, and I'm going to tell you something, never jump into something like that, a church administration, a church leadership role, out of emotions. Don't jump 
In fact, never allow emotions to dictate your life choices like a spouse, a house, a career move. Take your time in all those areas and allow God to gently guide you. I had somebody ask me a question the other day and I answered it quickly on the page. Easy answer. They were talking about, you know, when God brings uh, a relationship to a person, how do you know, when do you know when the right time is? When God brings the woman to the man, the garden, the initial garden, first mentioned principle in the Bible is important to understand. When something is first mentioned or a principle comes up the first time in the Bible, pay attention to it and see if there's a pattern that goes in, in uh, Scripture. There is. God puts the woman in the man's path. The man's not out at the nightclub looking for her. God didn't have Adam at the club listening to music and getting hammered looking for the right hottie. No. God, the man had to be relaxed and put to sleep, and then God went to work and put the woman in the man's path, and the man got up and recognized her. That's a pattern. First mentioned principle. There's the answer to the question. Looking for a mate. Ladies, stop looking. Men, stop making a big issue out of it and thinking you're going to find it the right way in your flesh. Let God work. Grow up. Let God put the right one in your path. I think he asked me, the question was, how did you meet your wife? Listen, I've been married and divorced. I was married and divorced at a young age, long before I was born again and saved. And I did date some women along the way, and I thought, well, this one's the right one, that one's the right one. And I made some mistakes along the way, and I gave up. I gave up and said, that's it, I'm just going to study the Word of God. I'm a deacon. I want to be a, a Christian author. I didn't know I was going to be a pastor. I ran from that. So I'm just going to say, the heck with relationships. I'm getting older. It's not going to happen. I stopped looking. At about six months or eight months after I stopped looking, I went to a friend's house to watch a Red Sox game, and my wife was invited there, and she had been divorced uh, probably a year prior to that, and she just happened to be there. At a Christian gathering of some friends, a strange woman was put in my path at a gathering, and we became friends. I stopped looking. God put her in a group of people where I was invited. That's how it happened. I always thank my buddy Don for having that afternoon of people over to watch the Red Sox. <laughs> and my wife and I started a tradition of going to Red Sox games, which I stopped this year because of all the nonsense with the flag. Again, we'll cover these principles, but never jump into something out of emotions, folks. Whether it is a job, a career, a move, a house, a relationship, anything, certainly not ministry, take your time. In all those areas, allow God to gently guide you while you pray and look for the openings God gives you. Now, another piece of advice for career opportunities or spiritual callings, because they are oftentimes two different callings, is to never make a move out of greed or desire for power. I'll say it again. Another piece of advice, free of charge, for career opportunities or spiritual callings, because they are oftentimes Two different callings. What do you mean? You might be a great carpenter, but that doesn't mean that's going to be your spiritual gift. Your spiritual gift might be something different. But if you're a good carpenter and there's a church that needs to be building and you want to support it, God may be using you in that arena. But I can tell you something. Opportunities or uh, career callings and spiritual callings, oftentimes two different callings. You don't know is never to make a move, my advice, never make a move out of greed, thinking, well, I'm going to make more money if I jump and do this, and God wants me to do that. Be careful. Or power. Well, I want the authority. Just be careful. That's all I'm telling you, what your motivation is when you think you're coming upon a new career opportunity or a spiritual calling. They may not be what you think. We covered a scripture last lesson that points us to the entrance into your personal plan of God. What's the entrance into your personal plan of God? When the doorway opens after you've gotten through the initial plan of God, the doorway opens where? For your personal plan, Romans 8, 28. We just covered it. And we know that God causes all things to work together. Your personal plan, your spiritual calling will work together for those who occasionally go to church. For those who read their Bible once a month. For those who believed on Jesus Christ 10 years ago, but haven't followed through with anything. No. And we know that God, Romans 8, 28, causes all things to work together for good. The entrance of that personal plan to those who love God, relationship, to those who are called according to his purpose. 
There's the entrance door right there. Those who love God. Having a relationship with God will guide you towards spiritual calling and your personal sense of destiny. That's what it's called sometimes, personal sense of destiny. We can see the calling for men who are assigned to church leadership in Scripture. Pretty easy to see. Ephesians 4.11, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. There's a Scripture right there that says, yes, you need leadership in your church. You can't just be out on an island by yourself. If you're stuck that way and you have to just read your Bible, yes, go for it. But if you have the opportunity to get under church leadership like pastors, evangelists, and deacons, get under them. These are spiritual callings that you find when your personal plan unfolds in your life after you've grown up a little bit. Understand that principle. When you gain levels of spiritual maturity, you start to recognize how and even where God may want you to use you. You'll recognize how and even where God wants to use you, and it'll start to unfold and say, oh, I think I need to go in this direction. I think my calling is over here. It is not always in an area you're strong in. Sometimes it is. Just telling you in your personal life. It is not always an area you're strong in. You might be surprised, such as within your career or your daily life. But, you will find that it suits you perfectly once you begin to walk in it more and more over time. And you're like, now I know, God, this is my spiritual calling. It may be different from your career. Hebrews 2.4 God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders, by the various miracles, and by what? Gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. God the Holy Spirit works in everybody's life to show them their calling. When they get to a certain place of maturity, God starts to open that door and the Holy Spirit whispers and guides and leads you and says, try this over here. This might be your calling. Many believers do not realize there are permanent spiritual gifts and temporal spiritual gifts. What do you mean permanent spiritual gifts and temporal? There are. Temporal such as what? Tongues? Apostleship, prophecy, were for the early church, the establishment period of the church. That's it. Sorry to tell you. Your spiritual gifts and calling unfold inside your personal plan. Though you first need to gain some maturity and figure it out, it'll unfold. The believer must first have mastered the initial plan of God, which is what? Here it is. Here's the overview. When somebody says, what's the plan of God? You can say, well, there's actually two. There's a generalized plan of God for the whole world and believers. And then there's your personal plan. Here's the general plan. Believers must first have mastered the initial plan of God. Salvation. Got to get through that gate. Salvation gate. Spiritual growth. Evangelism in some form or another. At least operate and try it. Spiritual strength. You gain momentum. Love, the right kind of love, impersonal, unconditional, godly love, and operating as an ambassador for Christ by what? Lifting his word up in this lost and dying world. Being an active member of a body. Supporting ministries and doing things to get the word out. This, this world is lost and dying. We need to get the word, the truth out there. If you know a man uh, 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 that's teaching accurately, lift him up. Find a way to support him. Get the word out. If you know a woman that's doing outreach programs that are Christian outreach programs, get her the right information so she's handing out the right documents and saying the right things because no, women are not pastor teachers. I've told you that before. It's not in the Word. Nothing to do against women. Some women are way more intelligent than men, even their husbands. I can attest for that in many realms. But a woman is not called to be a pastor teacher. Sorry to tell you. A lesson for another day. Until the believer gets this under their belt, they will never fully grasp what their personal plan and calling is all about until they get through that on the board. You're not going to grasp what your personal plan is all about. In fact, God might not even reveal it to you until you get through some of these stages I show you on the board here of the initial plan. Just a fact, folks. Outside of the calling of the church leadership or church administration, other callings inside a personal plan may be the gift of help or assistance, you're very good at helping and coming to the rescue of people and fixing things or maybe working around a church or a ministry or doing something even in your community that's very helpful. Perhaps a gift of compassion. Some people are more compassionate than others. Compassion for those in need 
or the ability to lift up those who are being oppressed or in tough situations. Some people are wonderful with that. It's like a, a gift of mercy, some people call it. Just phenomenal. They don't care. They'll go to the hospital two or three times a month or go to the VA and help out or do certain things. They have levels of mercy and compassion. Phenomenal. Perhaps you're blessed with a greater wealth. Many people are. And you can give more than the average believer because the average believer should be supported. Get on a schedule, support a ministry, figure it out. But maybe you have greater wealth. So your calling is to be an even more generous giver than others. I can't tell you that. Your pastor shouldn't get involved in your finances. Don't let him do that to you. Don't let him guilt you. The reality is there's no limits. There's no limits to what God may call you to do. What may unfold in your personal plan. I don't know. Everybody's different. You could be a truck driver who has a calling to be a prep school teacher at a church. Well, that doesn't make sense. Why not? I was a prep school teacher. I was a prep school teacher. I was an usher. I was a deacon. I was an assistant to a pastor. I was an associate pastor. Now I'm a pastor. I knew my calling. I saw my growth. I knew where God was leading me. It took me time. But you could be a truck driver who has a calling to be a prep school teacher or a nurse with the calling for the gift of cleaning and maintenance in your church. I don't know. Maybe you're really good at cleaning and maintaining the church, and yet your calling in your natural realm, your, your, your career as a nurse or a doctor. I don't know. Perhaps you're called to work at the local homeless center, and you're a corporate lawyer in your career. Perhaps you're called to, um, I don't know, donate to certain ministries, and you're actually... A politician or something like that. I don't know what you what it's going to be, folks. Let's close in Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, royal family. What I can tell you is what I tell all people, and I've heard it from other good pastors along the way. Don't put God in a box. Do not put God in a box. I don't know. Don't limit what God may do with your spiritual calling, your gift, or your career opportunities. I don't know. As you grow, your calling or gift may change that happens occasionally i just myself i can show you that myself as you grow your calling or gift see sometimes god puts you through certain things because he's getting you ready for something else joshua was in the background as an assistant to moses he was a gopher for a long time joshua was a gopher for moses next thing you know he's led in there and he's the leader and he was probably trained as a teenager in some military combat under the Egyptian slavery, they often would take the young boys who were tough and, and rugged young boys and teach them military tactics and fighting because they were going to use them in their army. It's a good call. Joshua might have had a little military training as a young teen, 17, 18 years old, and then under Moses, he was an assistant, and he became the leader himself. I don't know. David, as a teenager, 13, 14 years old, was able to walk with the flock of sheep from his father's herd and keep them safe and learn how to use a specialized slingshot and that helped him in his battle with Goliath. I don't know what God's training you for, but as you grow, your calling and gift may change. That happens occasionally. You might be getting trained right now for something 10 years down the road. You may have a gift of bringing people together, bringing ministries together, and you're called to build programs outside your church. Maybe that's your calling. Maybe you're good with technology and you develop a way to help your pastor or your church branch out across the internet. I think about Gloria, what she did on Facebook. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. I think about Pastor Rick Kabrick, a very close friend of mine who's still affiliated with Grace Bible Church. He took his technology and what little he knew about the internet and he took a ministry 10, 12 years ago that's Grace Bible Church, gbible.org, put it on the internet. Now it has a thousand... Uh, followers across the uh, internet and it touches everywhere from Africa to the Philippines to here in America. One man decided to take his gift. Gloria decides to take her gift, her calling, and gets involved in 10 different programs and Bible studies and all these people are getting touched by the Word of God. I don't know. I don't know what your calling is. I don't know the callings and gifts that unfold inside your personal plan and, and will never come to fruition though. It'll never come to fruition if you don't live in the initial plan that we covered at first and understand that first. Romans 12.4. Romans 
For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, we just looked at that, verse 5, so we who are many are one a body in Christ, and individual members one of another, Romans 12, 5, Romans 12, 6, since we have gifts, there it is, gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Do something with it. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. I told you some temporary gifts. There's one right there. Romans 12, 7. If service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching. Romans 12, 8. Or he who exhorts in his exhortation of lifting others. He who gives with liberality, generous. He who leads, be a leader with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. What is your calling? I don't know. And I can tell you right now that word prophecy, when you see it on the board, oh no, it's not on that one, is it? It's on the next one, verse 7. Prophecy, oftentimes, what the apostles are talking about were those who were helping to finish the scriptures for the end times, to finish the New Testament. That's a lot what it really meant. That is a temporary gift. Like tongues and many other things, it is done away with, whether you choose to believe that or not. What's your calling? What's your gift? I don't know. Pray about it. Figure it out. First out, get through the initial plan of God before that secondary personal plan. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time. Bless those that take these messages out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.